Welcome to The Real Python Podcast. This is episode 147. Have you decided how you're going to deploy your Django project? Should you use a virtual private server or a platform as a service? Christopher Trudeau is back this week, bringing another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. We also have organizers from PyCascades to share details about this year's hybrid in-person and virtual conference. Christopher shares an article about selecting an appropriate Django project deployment strategy. The guide compares virtual private server and platform as a service systems. He also covers hosting providers for each and highlights potential pitfalls. We share several other articles and projects from the Python community, including a news update, what's new in SQL Alchemy 2.0, how to flush the output of the Python print function, the dangers behind image resizing for machine learning, a project that visualizes pathfinding algorithms, and a runtime executor project. We also have three special guests from PyCascades 2023 to dig into the details of the conference. Conference Chair Eliza Serbaza is CTO at Women Who Drone and Leadership Fellow Python Track and Python Developer Advocate at Women Who Code. Sprint's Chair Chetna Gobanath is a software engineer at Realtor.com and a senior lead at Women Who Code Python. And Speaker Support Chair Jolene Wong is a senior software engineer at Cisco, based in Vancouver. We discuss hosting a hybrid conference, participating in open source sprints, and finding your local Python community. This episode is brought to you by Sneak. Sneak helps Python developers stay secure without slowing down by providing real-time code scanning and actionable fix advice right from their IDE. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, Christopher, welcome back. Hey, hello from a very snowy Toronto. We finally got our winter. Oh, my gosh. We've been holding it hostage here in Colorado, (laughs) (laughs) and it escaped. (laughs) You you can have it back. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So you found a little news thing just just as we were going to begin. Yeah, just a quick one-liner. The 4.2 beta of Django has been released just a couple days before we started recording. Uh, So if you're playing around with the new thing, go check it out. Awesome. Your article is kind of related to a release also, right? Yeah, ish. Sure. So uh, I'm starting out this week with uh, something called What's New in SQL Alchemy 2.0, and it's by uh, Miguel Grinberg. In case you're not familiar, SQL Alchemy is a Python library that abstracts working with databases in SQL. It's been around for a while. Its first release was 2006. And if you've worked with the ORM in Django, parts of it are similar to that. And the the reason I say part of it is because SQL Alchemy is made up of two chunks, uh, what it calls core and the ORM. And the core part is a series of direct wrappers to SQL. So if you're doing an insert in SQL, you're going to be calling a statement builder that uses an insert function and then executing that statement. And the ORM, well, ORMs are, are, that's short for object relational mapping. And it's based on the idea of writing objects or classes that map to underlying database concepts. So I might describe a person with a first name and a last name, and the ORM would map that to tables in the database, for example. SQL Alchemy has been going through a transition. Um, The 2.0 release is recent, uh, but the ideas behind it were introduced in 1.4 as to sort of ease people into it. And the 1.4 release allowed the use of a new API, as well as the original, giving developers a chance to experiment and transition and move forward. So the article, uh, first half of it, is essentially detailing that transition. Uh, The old way that you used to use a query object and the new way that uses this statement building concept that I just mentioned. And now you're sort of building these statements and executing them. The advantage of the new mechanism is it provides a distinction between the query you're performing and the environment you're performing it in, whereas before those things were tightly linked. The legacy stuff is still there, uh, just deprecated, so it gives you time to transition your existing code base if you've got some. 
The next part of the article talks about the introduction of session management through context managers. Uh, we've talked about context managers recently in the show a couple times. And this session manager takes advantage of the same idea. So you don't have to remember to close your session. Once you're outside of the with block, uh, the context manager does all the cleanup for you. And then there are also a bunch of typing improvements. SQL Alchemy uses types or built-in type-like structures before Python had types uh, to describe things like columns. And now because Python's got a lot more typing in it, uh, SQL Alchemy is now taking advantage of a lot of that. So this is helpful if you're using the IDE. And it also means you can import fewer things into your code because now you can use the Python types in a lot of the cases. Uh, there are a few other small things that the article briefly talks about, uh, including things like uh, the async I.O. capabilities before wrapping up. But otherwise, you know, uh, Miguel's an experienced author. He's written books on Flask and MicroPython, and now he's got a new book coming out on SQL Alchemy 2. So if you want to learn more, there's the article and the book. Yeah, I've mentioned his uh, mega Flask tutorial multiple times, which is uh, on his blog, which is a really great resource for somebody getting started in Flask. And then you have a SQL Alchemy course, right? Uh, yes, I do. <laughs> yes. How many courses have I done? <laughs> uh, I just put 35 in the can. So, uh, no, I was trying to remember whether it had been published yet because it's, yeah, yeah. it's been on the mind. Yes, there is, uh, there is something there at uh, RealPython if you, uh, you want to dig into it. It is based on 1.4, but because it's based on 1.4, it does show you the new way of doing things that uh, 2.0 takes advantage of. Cool. Well, my first one is a real Python article, and it's by previous guest Martin Broyce, been on the show a few times. And I looked at it and I said, wait, didn't we talk about this um, in Chris's uh, <laughs> course about printing? And the title is, I don't know, somewhat misleading. It actually spends more time on one topic than what the title says. The title is how to flush the output of the Python print function. And... Yes, it does do that. It talks about it inside of a couple different situations, but also spends a lot of time talking about the idea of like, well, what are we talking about flushing? And it's about buffers really more than anything. If you look at the table of contents, um, almost every line has buffer in it. Data buffering is interesting concept and how it's sort of handled and kind of this article and tutorial dives into the nitty gritty of it and covers like, flushing the output of the data buffer explicitly using the flush parameter that's part of your print statement. You might not have looked at what your, I'm sorry, I always say print statement and I'm wrong. It's the print function. <laughs> You're just showing your age. It, it I used know. To be, I, it I, used to be a statement. I know. And I just, I, I don't know why I sometimes slide that in there. Um, so it, you're, you're making a statement. Yeah, there that's, we go. That's, that's why. Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. um, if you haven't looked at the, you know, additional parameters and things that you can add argument-wise into print, uh, flush is one of those things. And changing the data buffering for a single function, the whole script, or even the entire Python environment, something else that's kind of covered. And then determining when you would want to do this or when you would need to do it explicitly, uh, you know, how it's necessary. As it dives pretty deep into this, which is interesting, it also you might, again, be more interested in how print's kind of doing this, but there's lots of code examples along for you to kind of play with. One of the things that it starts with is this concept that I, you know me, I always want to like dive into like, okay, well, what does that actually mean? And one of the statements is, when making a call to a file-like object, quotes around it, and I was like, okay, wait a second here. Let's go to docs.python.org and say, well, what is a file object? And it's kind of funny. Uh, the file light object goes right back to a cinnamon for a file object. <laughs> okay, well, what's a file object? Well, it's just above that in there. And it's an object exposing a file-oriented API with methods such as read and write to an underlying resource. Depending on the way it was created, a file object can mediate access to real on disk files or to another type of storage or communication device. And that's where it kind of gets interesting because that means standard input output, the kind of stuff that displays, you know, when you do a print and uh, in-memory buffers or sockets, pipes, and other things. File objects are also called file-like objects or streams. And so, okay, all right. So buffering has to do with all of those, which I think is what this is kind of diving into and kind of made a little more interesting. Instead of a constant connection, 
data is going to be held in this buffer until it's ready or full, and then it's going to write it all at once. And he uses some sort of traffic examples in there, which is partly true. Like, as I just said, it's either ready or full when it's going to write it all out. What's interesting is, well, why would you want to change this behavior? In the print example, it's to do things that you might want to do like in a CLI or other kinds of situation where you don't want the typical end of the buffer being printed out and it moving to the next line. You might want it to do something kind of interesting where it's like doing a countdown all in one line or a, a progress meter. And your course really dives deep into that. The Python print function, go beyond the basics, you know, gets to play with flush and the end parameter that you can kind of adjust those kinds of things and how that kind of works in there. As far as the buffering goes, the other thing that you may want, like I said, is this sort of instant interactive environments on REPL or writing to the terminal and watching those kinds of progress. Another might be you're monitoring a file and trying to see what's going on with it. But if it's using print to do sort of its logging features, that information is going to be held in a buffer until the program's done and you won't sort of see it as it's going. It's, that's the example that he uses kind of throughout this to kind of check it out. And so he talks about the different types of data buffering. The interactive environment is the line buffered type, or if you think of like the REPL, that print part of the REPL. After it gets beyond the initial stuff of that interactive env environment, and he starts to talk about this other idea, the situation of like a long-running program that's using print to log information, he starts to get into this area of like, okay, well, how could you adjust the system in how you're running it by using, it actually has kind of like different ways that the block buffering can be held onto. And you're going to use this flush equals true in your print. Each print, it actually then flushes out the buffer and that information then will print inside the terminal as it's running. But another two ways that you could do it, it gets into is you could also change the environment that you're working there in your terminal and you could run an environment variable that's all caps python no space unbuffered and which is an interesting setting i don't know if i would do that as much um the third one is an interesting other choice that gets into another area that i don't know if we've covered too much in here we've talked a little bit about func tools and sort of modifying how a particular function works but there's a a method that's part of func tools, if you import that, that you can then apply to an existing function. It's called partial, where you can kind of permanently apply a parameter or sort of freeze some portion of the function's arguments or keywords so that it's always going to be set that way. By default, print normally has a flush equals false on and or flush equals like nothing. Um, but you can change it using this partial tool and he goes through how to do that inside there. So you do a statement, something like print equals func tools dot partial parentheses print, which is the thing you want to modify, comma, and then you put flush equals true. And that's going to modify the in-place print function. Now, another way to do it would be to actually give it a different name instead of, you know, overriding the existing print function. So he talks a little bit about that. But that, so it's a lot of interesting, you know, slightly advanced concepts going on inside of here, talking about, you know, file-like objects, buffering, this func tools solution is kind of interesting, all in what I thought, which often happens with the real Python tutorials is like, oh, this will be really simple, just kind of be covering, you know, that keyword that you can kind of play with inside of the print function. And it's like, no, actually, there's a whole lot more to it. So I, I enjoyed that part of it, learned a little more about how kind of buffering works, and then learned another interesting use of functools.partial. I'll include a link to that if you're interested in learning a little more about func tools. I'll have some, a link to the Python docs for that. But yeah, I just thought it was an interesting tutorial, had a kind of a different angle than I thought it would go. So what's your next one? This next one's deep, or at least long. Okay. It's called the Essential Django Deployment Guide, uh, and it's posted on the SAS Pegasus blog. They're a Django tooling company that provides boilerplate and utilities for Django projects. They are a for-profit thing. This isn't an open source product, but the blog posting has links to all sorts of different 
companies and hosts. And although there's an occasional, you should try us out, it's pretty low key. It doesn't come across as, uh, it's just genuine info and readable. It's not just an ad. The, the article starts out by giving you the basics of what a Django architecture looks like. You know, you need a web server, you need Django itself and a database. And then, you know, the recommended setup also has static files like images, JavaScript, CSS, all that kind of good stuff is being served by your web server or a CDN. Uh, you're not supposed to spit that out from Django. Django isn't really optimized for that. The depth of it is really about how you put these pieces together and the different ways of rolling them out there and what your choices are. He starts out by eliminating two of the popular sort of hosting choices, first being Kubernetes and the second being serverless. It eliminates Kubernetes due to the overhead. And unless you're, if you're reading this kind of article, you're probably not publishing a millions of users per second kind of site. So Kubernetes is probably overkill for you in this case. And as for serverless, uh, it's interesting technology, but it doesn't really fit the Django model very well. So the rest of the article then kind of gets divided into two pieces, uh, VPS and PaaS. So VPS stands for Virtual Private Server, and the short version of that is you're going to be managing everything yourself. And PaaS is short for Platform as a Service, and those attempt to manage as much of your system as possible. And of course, it's actually a spectrum. There's things that are kind of in between. Yeah. Some common examples of VPS hosting are DigitalOcean Droplets, Linode, in AWS land, it's LightSail and EC2. There are varying degrees, but for the most part, this setup means you've got a shared or dedicated machine in the cloud somewhere, and you're responsible for installing pretty much all of those architecture bits that I talked about, the web server, the Django stuff, and the database. Some of those hosting companies also offer a database as a service, so that allows you to sort of move along the spectrum a bit and you're not in control of all of it. On the other end of the spectrum is a past setup and that's where the server architecture is mostly hidden from you. Uh, so common offerings for this are Heroku, Render, Fly.io, and uh, DigitalOcean's got a product called App Platform. This style typically provides a container of some sort for your Django code, and then it uses services for the other parts, so you're not having to think about it and wire it all together. But halfway through the article, there's a nice table describing what might influence your choice between the two. VPS tends to be cheaper, but more complicated to build and a lot more work for you. Pass tends to be more expensive, uh, but you lose out on some flexibility. Pass tends to scale slightly better as they've taken care of a lot of the infrastructure stuff for you, whereas right. with VPS, you're going to have to roll that yourself. One thing the article doesn't mention uh, that sometimes influences my choice in this situation is the debugging process. You're closer to the metal in VPS, which means you're in more control of being able to figure out why something's not working when it goes wrong. Yeah. Pass tends to be a little more magical. And as long as the magic works, you're good. And if it doesn't, you have to hunt down the little elves and make them fix it for you, which can sometimes be problematic. Article generally recommends going with a pass, uh, and I more or less agree with them. They do talk about a couple of corner cases, and depending on what you're building and your experience level, why you might go with a VPS instead. And that's only the first half of the article. So uh, for the sake of brevity, I'm not going to keep going over it in detail. The rest of it starts talking about how to choose a hosting provider, how to figure out how to support your system, and other things that can influence these choices. So really good, really in-depth read. Uh, and even if you're not a Django person, if you're doing any sort of web development, understanding that whole VPS versus pass trade-off yeah. is an important part of going to production. And you may find value here, even if, you, even if you're you know, not, not, a, not a Django deployment. Yeah. Uh, so if you're into Flask or something else, you're, you're going to be dealing with a lot of the same uh, choices. Yeah, unless you're setting up static stuff. Um, <laughs> you're going to need some extra stuff, yeah. Yeah, pretty much. For Yeah, uh, yeah. It, it extends. If we have any non-Python folks listening to the show, this extends out to other things as well, right? Like, it's pretty much, if you are building for the web, yeah, yeah. you have to understand these. Yeah, because I feel like often the, the words get thrown around of, like, setting up your Kubernetes and all that kind of stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's... Yeah. Uh, not everybody's going to scale that way. So, and, and well, it's also it's also one of the it's one of the hard things I find for uh, folks who are learning this kind of technology because you know Django comes with all these tools that you can run locally, and so like you can get right. the site going and you can get all excited, and then you're like, okay, now I have to put it on the on the web, and then you're like, wait a second, uh, yeah, what does that say? 
<laughs> like it, it's not a matter of okay, did just upload this code somewhere. It's like now you have to make all these decisions, and you might have to understand what elastic something or other is, and it just starts to right. be very daunting for somebody who's new to it. And a lot of these have fees that you kind of have to think about. Yes. What's interesting is you can usually play around a little bit. There's like a free tier with AWS where you can kind of try some of these things, but yeah. And it varies. And unfortunately, this stuff changes over time as well, right? So Heroku was yeah was well accepted in the community for having a free tier for the longest time. And eventually they got rid of it, right? And, and that kind of thing changes how you do stuff. And, and although the article, like I said, is, is very much sort of VPS versus pass, there are also some uh, providers out there that are kind of part way, one of my favorite providers technically is a VPS, but they come with a whole bunch of Django-specific tooling and they provide a database as a service. So like you've got a fair amount of control uh, in comparison to something like Heroku where you're just dumping everything inside of a Git repo, but uh, you don't have to wire everything together and they they front a lot of it. So there, there's a lot of choice out there. <laughs> yeah, it's nice to have a, some guides <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, play around with this stuff. Uh, I think, Yes. Yeah. As much as this is a, you know, a Python programming podcast, a lot of, you know, we've talked about projects and, and so forth, but just being experienced with like some of this, at least the complexity of it that you can kind of know where to look is always kind of an important part of the familiarity with it, you know, like understanding the pluses and minuses. Yeah. And, and hence the article's recommendation to stick with pass until you know better because... Because uh, otherwise, you're you know you're 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 just asking for trouble, right? Yeah, yeah, it can be. Yeah. There are a ton of ways for malicious actors to get into the systems you build, like SQL injection, arbitrary code execution, and out of bounds rights, just to name a few. Luckily, you don't have to be a security expert to keep your apps secure. Sneak is a developer security platform that helps you secure your applications from the start. And Sneak does it all right from the existing tools and workflows you already use. IDEs, CLI, repos, pipelines, and more. So your work isn't interrupted. Start your free Sneak account at sneak.co slash realpython. That's S-N-Y-K dot C-O slash realpython. My next one is from Marco Venturelli. It's on a website called Zuru, Z-U-R-U Tech. And I just want to talk about the company briefly because I thought that was actually really interesting. They're developing an architectural design and manufacturing software, which is abbreviated BIM, Building Information Modeling, enabling state-of-the-art, fully automated robotic production plants. And the idea is that you lowly you know individual can be an architect and use their online tool to design a house or a factory or whatever and kind of lay everything out using their stuff and then they actually design all the materials that lego together if you will i think it leads into like well why on their blog did they get into this thing and the blog post is titled The Dangers Behind Image Resizing, deals with machine learning and having to take this large amount of images and get to be, them to be a consistent size to be able to do training on your machine learning model. And there's an expectation that you would have about the behavior of different libraries that are used for machine learning and training that they would behave the same. And no, that's what it really gets into is that image resizing really varies across tools such as TensorFlow, PyTorch, or even one that we've used here and talked about a bunch, which is Pillow. There's a few papers that they reference. And at the very bottom of the article, there's some links that you can click on, dive a little deeper into sort of university research. And most of them have a free link to download the PDF on the paper to kind of check it out. But if you personally have ever taken an image, say it was a thousand by a thousand pixels, and you reduced it down to make a profile image of like a hundred by a hundred, you lose a lot, right? And there's a lot of different methodologies that go into how that's done. 
in exploring this, using very sort of simple objects to kind of, or uh, simple images to kind of get an idea of the types of artifacts that are introduced in this sort of section that they call qualitative results, an input image of 128 by 128 pixels of a circle and then downsampling it to 32 by 32 and then using these different libraries and then there inside of it in the downsampling there's a set of filters that you could use and it talks about these different methods that are used inside that parameters or whatever you want to set for it one is a, a nearest approach which often leads to lots of aliasing it's find the nearest pixel that was going to be represented inside that and then other approaches are bilinear, bicubic. And what's nice is that it goes through and shows, uh, you know, Pillow, OpenCV, TensorFlow, and PyTorch and how they kind of are behaving across this. And what's really kind of fascinating is the results that Pillow, in its default settings, are providing some of the best results on, on all of these examples that they're showing off. OpenCV, which is kind of a bit of a de facto standard out there, is actually producing some of the worst results. Whereas a better system, instead of just removing them or creating those kind of stair-stepped aliases, would do something called anti-aliasing, which will kind of give in-between pixels that kind of smooth the in-between. Again, Pillow and some of these other tools can do this. And then he does another like example with like a grid. Again, these are not images that you would think of like, oh, well, that's what I would normally be processing. Usually be people's faces or images of, in their case, probably uh, building materials and things like that. So in the case of this grid, it's, again, really surprising the results you get on these different libraries. TensorFlow can do anti-aliasing. It has a flag, but the default is off. It's basically set to false. And PyTorch has two methods, and one of them is actually a wrapper around the PIL library, Pillow's library. So anyway, it gets into all that. Lots of nice charts showing off this stuff. The article shows the one example of a simple grid and sort of thicker versions of the grids. And then it eventually lands into an area looking at, okay, actual like images uses a image of a dog. The, I guess the crux of it is that you need to be careful in choosing your library they were interested in deploying their particular application in C++ for performance. That's kind of what their stack was going to be. And Pillow's image processing algorithms, they are written in C, but they needed to be able to port them across, which they did. So they were able to kind of get all this set up and then were able to get it to work inside of their whole stack that was using OpenCV. And the upside of the whole thing is if you're doing this kind of image processing and you're doing resizing of lots of images, especially the sort of downsizing, they actually provide their library at the end of the article so you can kind of check it out and, and learn a little more about it. But it's interesting to learn some of these pitfalls are. And often in data science libraries, there's lots of default settings that you don't know are there and maybe you're providing results that are... <laughs> They might have been set for a particular reason. Maybe they thought that you wouldn't be doing lots of resizing or what have you, and it was going to save processing time or whatever. Uh, again, nice references at the end, uh, links to the academic research, and uh, a lot of them with the, the papers ready to go. So thanks for showing me this one, Christopher. Yeah, well, it, and, and training ML gets really kind of weird, right? So we like to think of it as, you know, that, that that it's thinking, but it's just a giant stochastic process. And, you know, if I if I feed it pictures of puppies and pictures of cats yeah. and all the pictures of puppies are black and white, what it might pick up on is puppies are black and white. So you feed it a black and white picture of whatever, the depression, it might classify it as a puppy because that's what it's done. It's an oversimplification, right? But so things like introducing artifacts into the images can start doing things like causing your model to pay attention to those artifacts. So if the artifacts are only showing up in certain situations, your models might actually start to learn about those artifacts. And what you end up doing is looking, have it looking for those artifacts rather than what you're what you actually want it to be looking for it can it can it can get really messy yeah and i could see that with their building stuff yeah that that would be really problematic with <laughs> architectural stuff yeah well th i think that brings us into projects um do you want me to go first on this one sure 
Okay, so mine, I really like this project. <laughs> First off, it, it, sometimes when I get projects, and I think I've mentioned this before, I've had problems where I couldn't get it set up easily and I just sort of end up beating my head against the wall and said, okay, well, I'm going to move to a different project or whatever. And I saw this one, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. And it set up so easily, which I was really impressed by. The results were really nice and so forth. So uh, hats off to um, Tasif Hilal Tantari. He's a computer scientist student, and I don't know if his uh, bio is still correct. I still had him in the freshman year of college, but he's been on GitHub for a while, so he might be a little further along. But the title is Pathfinding-Visualizer, Visualized Pathfinding with Pygame. And so it's using the Pygame engine to create a, a very pretty visualizer of a start and an endpoint for what would normally be something like a maze and it having to go through different path finding algorithms but to play with it it's again was very simple for me the requirements text file uh, had one item pi game equals equals 2.1.2 and installed so quick on my macbook i was really impressed so um pi game seems to be working really well even with an m1 processor now which is nice there's two things that you might get out of this project. One is just the visualization, how pathfinding algorithms overall work. He has pathfinding for Jykstra and A star. He has a couple other ones. In first, um, let's see, breadth first search BFS, depth first search DFS, greedy best first search. And so you can kind of choose any of those and also, what's kind of fun is it's a very nice interface. So you're kind of learning a little bit about Pygame, just sort of checking out this interface. And it looks like a game, you know, that you're setting up. You can choose where your start node is, choose where the end node is, and then you can actually create the walls of a, a maze if you want or add these little weighted node symbols and then, you know, run it. But it also has a maze generator or ways to sort of clear the stuff out. You can have it do it quickly. You could choose the speed that you want it to go. It uses really kind of pretty animation and colors. It's just a neat project. And again, you're learning quite a bit about how these algorithms go through finding the correct path, but also might be interesting to use to actually look at the code and see not only how the algorithms are implemented, but also like how he created this interface and sort of level builder uh, and animations. So nicely done. Uh, I really like this project a lot. What's your project? So I've got something called RTX, and it's by Jeff Dickey. Um, it's not a Python thing, uh, but could be helpful for your Python. Uh, if you're familiar with ASDF, uh, it's a clone of that written in Rust. So both ASDF and RTX are tools that are sort of like virtual environment tools in Python. They run at the bash level, though. And so because of that, you can create entire environments, not just Python ones. So the primary use case in Python would be to create a separate space, both for a version of Python, as well as all the libraries that go with it. Okay. The read the docs site, for example, uses ASDF to switch between Python versions in exactly this way. So if um, read the docs defaults to whatever the the oldest supported language is. So I think right now it's Python 3.7. So you have to set something that says, I want, you know, 3.9, 3.10, whatever you want. And when you do that, if you look through the details of the log as it's building your doc, it says ASDF space Python dash nine. And essentially it's setting up a little like quasi environment inside of the shell. Uh, and RTX uh, is, is doing the same thing uh, in, from what I can tell, a better and faster way. So what it's really doing here is it's mucking around with your shell path. It watches for a file called .tool-versions in your directory and uses that to map it to an environment. So once you've got your environment set up, uh, if you CD into the new directory, you're using the new environment. So project one is Python 3.6, and then you CD into project two, and it's pro Python 3.9. And if you've set it up correctly, it does that, and you never have to call activate or any of that stuff that we do in the Python space. 
It's available through RTX is available through most of your typical package of providers on Unix, uh, you know, app, get yum, cargo, all that kind of good stuff. And you can also download it yourself uh, works out of the box with ZSH and bash. And there are some tweaks you can do to get it to work with a couple of the uh, lesser known shells. And uh, there's a ton of uh, configuration variables. So you have fine grain control on know where it keeps things and how it behaves so uh neat little tool i haven't had a chance to use it for a big project yet but it's uh it's definitely got my attention for the future okay you see you might put this into your uh tool chain it, i think it it might it, it works as an interesting alternative to pyenv because pyenv essentially tries to do something similar for your different python uh setups and the advantage would be is you would be able to use it for other things as well. So if you're going off and building a Node project, you can do the same thing that you do here with Node, whereas in PyEnv... Include those environment stuff. Yeah, whereas PyEnv would be Python-specific. So having something that's a little more generic would uh, would allow you to get uh, uh, some control over uh, in, in the environment this way. And because all it's doing is uh, swapping out your path environment variable once things are set up, it's really, really, really fast because yeah. it, it really is just a, a quick little text change in the environment. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, def- definitely worth playing with. That's what they meant by polyglot, right? The That it can work with all those languages yeah okay yeah well christopher thanks for coming on the show and bringing all these articles and projects again this week always fun i'm gonna go shovel all right good luck up next we're gonna dig into the details of pi cascades 2023 this week i want to shine a spotlight on another real python video course it's about a topic most people think they already know it's titled the python print function go beyond the basics. The course is based on a tutorial by Bartosz Jaczynski, and in the video course, my co-host Christopher Trudeau takes you on a journey beyond the fundamentals and shows off features like string formatting, using pretty print, the parameters of SEP, end, and flush, creating animations with print, building more advanced user interfaces within the terminal, character encodings, escape sequences, printing to file streams, and debugging. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn a bit more about a feature you use so often. And like most of the video courses on RealPython, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, and you get code examples for the techniques shown. All lessons have a transcript, including closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the search tool on realpython.com. Hey, I want to welcome a new team from the Pi Cascades group here back to the Real Python podcast this year. With me, I have Eliza Serboza, Jaitna Gopanath, and Jolene Wong. So welcome to the show. Thanks for having us. Hi, glad to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, yeah. Just want to add, um, I'm Eliza, so I'm the conference co-chair for the upcoming Pi Cascades 2023 conference. Jaitna is our, our sprints chair. And also Jolene is our speaker support chair. So yeah, really excited to have all of us on the call today. So let's just cover some quick details. When When is the conference? Uh, it's scheduled from March 18th to 19th for the speaker talks. We'll also set like having it, you know, back in person, finally, post pandemic in Vancouver, BC at SFU, Simon Fraser University, uh, Harbor Center campus in the I think Seagal rooms on the Friday night for the conference, March 17th. So St. Patrick's Day, (laughs) uh, we'll be hosting our pre-social at the Microsoft uh, head office in Vancouver, where, you know, you can pick up your badges the night before. So there's less of um, a bottleneck on Saturday morning. But on Saturday and Sunday, we'll having our speaker talks. And then the Monday, March 20th, will be the Sprint Day projects. All right. Awesome. And you're doing sort of a combination, like you said, of it being virtual and in person this year, which is a, a change. Right. Yeah. We're really surprised like how successful it was to have it as a remote conference. If you've joined us the past two years, High Cascades was on the Venueless platform. And we've had like a lot of great reviews from like attendees and speakers like using the software. And it's just been an interesting experience. Like, okay, what are logistics involved? Like going online, you know, how do you support the speakers, attendees attend the conference and help everyone to like, you know, be successful. 
Uh, but this year, as I said, we're, you know, going back to in-person and, you know, a few logistical ch- challenges you've experienced is some of like the people we've worked with, maybe they're just not available, right? Or as we said, there's different venues have like different pricing. Uh, we were scheduled a bit later in the year. You can tell like this is my first time organizing it in-person versus hybrid. So that's a lot to learn. Yeah. That. <laughs> yeah. So it's learn. It's like, what do you want to like book um, at a venue? It's like going oh, to like, you know, quite a few months in advance. Right. Also with catering, there's a lot of um, food allergies or restrictions. Um, obviously, it's also different. Right. With versus uh, in Canada or U.S. I think this is something else that maybe other conferences recognize that, you know, with sponsorship, it reflects the current economy. Right. So it's not as much as like previous years, but, you know, we want everyone to feel supported and like be able to attend the conference, have a great time. That's why we continued having in-person and remote. And also the most important thing, you know, our COVID policy. Yeah. You know, we will have like, I think more than enough tickets for remote, but because it's in-person, there's a fire code in the building. So we have to limit in-person ticket numbers to a certain amount. Uh, but we're doing enforced masking. We have more information on our website. So piecascades.com forward slash uh, COVID. Awesome. And there are some in-person tickets still available. Yes, there are. So um, I know it's a typical Vancouver thing that we all like, you know, sign up last minute. (laughs) Are we (laughs) procrastinate? I've I've heard this like from everyone. So yeah, there are still tickets available. You can also uh, order swag. We have the badges, t-shirt, and a few other things. I've I think as a team, Jolene and Chasna, they we've already seen like the colors and the shirts and like everything looks really amazing. So really looking forward to seeing everyone at the conference. So I thought we could get into a little bit about how each of you got involved with the conference. The panel seems to change each time. Maybe we could start. Chaitna, do you want to start with how you got involved with Pi Cascades? Yeah, yeah, sure. Actually, this was a this was a kind of a funny story because I mean, not exactly funny, but it was like coincidental because uh, in October, there was October of 2022, there was Hacktoberfest. Okay. And then I was working on an, on an introduction to Git and GitHub and open source stuff for Women Who Code Python. And then Eliza, she's a fellow at Women Who Code Python. And so after that, the timing perfectly clicked for us to basically talk about this. She let me know about Pi Cascades. And then after looking into my specific role as the sprints organizer, I thought this would be a good way to put together whatever I was passionate about most of the time and then see if it can reach like a wider audience and have more impact. And and I love Python. Yeah. I've been using it for personal projects and for work. So it's it, it all sort of like married together, I feel like. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, that's how I got into it. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sprints? Is that okay? We can dive into that now? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Every year in Pi Cascades, we have something, a separate segment that's away from the conference talks called sprints. And this is very interesting because like, it has like different open source projects participating within it. And the attendees of the conference can choose to participate in one or more of these open source projects that decide to come into sprints. So if there's somebody who's new to open source or who has never like gotten into it, they can look at a project that's participating in PyCascade sprints and they can work on an issue on it or see how they can contribute to it. And it's really versatile because it's not just for beginners, it's for like everybody who is very passionate about open source, who always wanted to get into it, but like, yeah, you know, they were into personal projects more. So it's a, it's a really open space. It's a very safe and comfortable space to do all of this at one venue. Yeah. I just want to add, like, you know, we're still looking for more yep. sprints, um, maintainers and pro- uh, projects, and they're also available either remote or... Uh, in person. Yep. Okay. So you're looking, how would people, if they're interested, you're saying like other projects could submit that, hey, we would like some help and like to be involved. Is that part of what you're looking for? Yeah. So like anybody who's an open source maintainer of a Python-based project, if they want to participate in in Sprints, they can either reach out to us at sprints at pycascades.com, like that email, or they can basically reach out to us through an intake form that we created which has like a bunch of questions like 
such as like, what is your project URL? What do you feel like you can achieve from the sprints or, you know, like contact info and things like that. Okay, awesome. And then if people are interested in attending the sprints, when is that happening? Yeah, so they're right after the conference talks on March 20th, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay, in the same venue? Yeah, so SFU, same rooms. And then if you're interested in, in taking part in them, we talked about the, the timing. Is there any sort of like skill level or anything required to, to take part in the sprints? As an attendee or participant in Pi Cascades, there's no level at all. It's an amazing experience for everybody. That's where we're trying to make it an amazing experience by like talking to the maintainers as well of projects. But yeah. Nice. Switching to, to you, Jolene, how did you get involved with Pi Cascades? Yeah. So so same thing as Chetna, Eliza reached out to me and was like, hey, I'm looking for some people to help me with Pi Cascades. Would you be interested? Yeah. I'm like, yeah, sure. Like I, I was also feeling a little isolated during COVID. I was like, I need to find, you know, something to do, work with other people who are not just my coworkers at work as much as I love them. And I actually met Eliza in 2018 at a at a conference. So it's just coming full circle. Nice. Yeah. So what is it you're doing this year? This year, I am working at Pi Cascades as speaker support chair. And my main responsibilities are really just to be an interface between the speakers and whatever they would need from Pi Cascades and the organizers. And this might include like reaching out to them to get you know, just to remind them like, hey, we need your slides. Do you need some help with like your grant application? Do you guys need help figuring out your visas? You know, stuff like that. Just just kind of being a point of contact for the speakers. Yeah, you sound like a concierge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. Getting it all kind of going. That's great. Maybe we could talk a little bit about, Eliza, how did you get involved as a member of Pi Cascades? Uh, sure. Originally, I was volunteering uh, with Pi Ladies, and Marietta actually reached out to me and asked, can you help with Pi Cascades? She's one of the co-founders of the conference. And I was like, sure. And this was just, just before the pandemic. So I got to witness like firsthand front row seat, what it's like to pivot <laughs> from an in-person conference to remote. Yeah. And, uh, you know, create, helping create uh, documentation in Notion, learning to navigate, like, what are the pain points and what are the strengths of having a remote conference? Um, I know I didn't mention this announcement, but like one of the great things about having a remote conference, you know, we can support the international community. We have more like diverse, interesting speakers that may not be able to attend yeah. in person. And I think as everyone can see, you know, like, Working remotely is like pretty nice now, and there's a lot more services and technologies to support that feature. So I've volunteered in the role as a sponsorship chair for the past two years, and then this third year I'm joining as a conference chair with uh, Ben Barry and also with uh, Madison, who's a chair at large. Okay. And I just want to add to that with I'm also a leadership fellow at Women of Code Python. I was the local Vancouver chapter director prior to that, so. It's been a really interesting experience. And with Chaitna, like she mentioned, I've asked her for help um, <laughs> <laughs> from the Windows Code Python community. And Jolene, we met at the, I believe it's the Open Source Summit Conference when it was in Vancouver. Yeah, the Open Source Summit. And then we also uh, connected through Pi Ladies too. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm really grateful like to these communities that, you know, yeah. help women and like people who may not have had like a comp sci um, degree, like get involved in programming and like, Python community. I know for me, it's just when you're in school, like you're doing a lot, right? Like and doing extracurriculars, volunteering, and just like learning other things beside what your teachers assign to is like it's a lot on your plate. But I'm glad that you know there's a lot of people interested in being lifelong learners and have like these small communities where they can like continue to upgrade their skills, you know, and become uh, the best version of themselves. Yeah, like just learn stuff too. Yeah, I think in that these all these communities sound really fantastic and i'd like to include the links for a lot of that stuff um along with you know the conference obviously i think you mentioned at least four or five you know pie ladies uh, i think i've mentioned a few times on the show but uh women who code was uh is it women who code python is that the whole full name right because um women who code is like the big global yeah. community and they have technical tracks there's okay and python is one of those uh track communities oh cool yeah uh, so there's lots of these little communities where you 
can meet other like-minded people and kind of get involved. And it sounds like the Pacific Northwest has a lot of these, which is really fantastic. Um, so many people kind of getting started on things like this. Yeah. Have an accountability partner, you know, understand if you want to do more Python in your role. So if you make a mistake in the coding, like yeah. you can do it through projects and not get, you know, dinged at your uh, dinged at work or just, you know, getting a bad grade <laughs> at school, but still have the opportunity to learn these projects. And I've seen people have done like, you know, they switch careers or, you know, they're like just getting back to work or, you know, they're like um, stay-at-home parents and like everyone's like starting from a different level, but like they really thrive and they like, become more confident as they learn the programming and like Nazi is like, you know, this scary big obstacle. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's nice to have uh, people that, that are at your level or a little above to kind of walk you through and, and uh, yeah, just finding community, especially in this time, as uh, several other people already just mentioned, <laughs> um, is really great too. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about the venue? It'll be at Simon Fraser University, so SFU in Vancouver, and it's the downtown Harbor Center campus. We will have, uh, I think we're running one of the banquet rooms for the main presentation, but we'll also have one of the theaters, Fletcher Theater, where people, this is something I've I hadn't been aware of, you know, because I've always attended Pi Cascades as a remote attendee. But at in-person conferences, they actually have a separate room where you can like watch the live stream of the speaker talk oh. and the audio will be off. So you just read the subtitle. So if you need a room like, you know, to decompress or just, you know, just relax, like it's in a large room where it's quieter, you know, you don't have to listen to me live emceeing. <laughs> <laughs> you just like read it on the screen. Nice. So we'll also have that option. And, you know, because it's a campus, you know, we're located downtown, like easier to access by like transit, uh, handicap accessible. Um, I know I mentioned our ADB team, you know, just understanding, you know, how do all the wires and recording and the equipment set up, they'll be like taping down the wires. So if people like won't trip, like they'll be able to access all the stuff um, easily. Nice. Are any of you guys located in Vancouver? I think I, um, I'm the only one here that's located Vancouver proper. Okay. Yeah. Right. I'm in the suburbs. <laughs> okay. I'm in Burnaby, but I was uh, born and raised here. So I think it's like not too far, right? It's like maybe it's pretty close. 20 minutes on the SkyTrain. Yeah. <laughs> One of the unique things about Pi Cascades is that it's always kind of in the Pacific Northwest and between three of the kind of major hubs there, like Seattle, Portland, and Vancouver, right? Right, that's correct. I believe um, Pi Cascades originally started in Vancouver at the Granville Island as a conference there. And then, like, it's been moving back and forth. Yeah. So, yeah, it's like just interesting. Just a lot of people I've seen too with the Pi Cascades Python community. Like, I only see them at events. I don't see them like anytime outside of these events. So, <laughs> it's really, it's like a really great being like a uh, camaraderie. And like, I'm looking forward to seeing more like, you know, Vancouver people that maybe I haven't seen in person in the pandemic. I'll see them like at this conference in person. Yeah, I think a lot of people are excited to get out this year and see some people in person. So do you want to dive into a little bit about the talks that, or any ones that you would want to highlight? I don't want to take the shine off of anybody else, but maybe you're interested in a few of them. Maybe as a speaker support chair, Jolene, do you have any? Oh, well. That you're excited about to check out? I mean, there were, there were, I mean, this is my first actual Python. I've never actually attended a, like a Pi Cascades or even a Python conference. I've like done other conferences yeah uh, that's not to say that I, I have anything against python that being said python is not really like my day-to-day -day work language so i'm pretty interested in any of the okay like i don't have any specific ones but like basically all the beginner friendly-ish talks sure that we have a few of and that's the great thing about my cascades is that we've got stuff that's more for people who are new to python or wanting to learn a little bit more about python and if we've just got stuff that where people are writing stuff like I think we have one about like the meta meta programming in Python. I'm like, what's that? That sounds really complicated. But you know, there's there's something for everyone, honestly. And I think that's the great thing about PyTaskades. Yeah, the one that I was interested in because I've had him on the show a bunch of times is Brett Cannon, and we had talked about his uh, syntactic sugar uh, series that he's been writing as a blog for a long time. And uh, so I'm intrigued to see like what he's turned that into a talk as. Oh, syntactic sugar. That's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Eliza, are there any ones that you were interested in? Um, I was part of the CF, CFP review team. Yeah, sure. So I, I already, I'm a little bit, a little bit more familiar with the talks. I'm interested in ones that are uh, focused on Internet of Things, okay, uh, program and programming wisdom, and like cybersecurity. 
Python. I like C- I, what I really enjoyed from the talks at Python is like, oh, like more stuff we can do with programming that's not, you know, in the usual like software as a service, right? Like how can I use this in construction tech? How can I use this in fintech? Yeah. I think one of the Internet of Things uh, talks is like focus on air quality, which is like, you know, something's really important when we're dealing with like forest fires or just like, you know, combating like uh, pollution. Yeah. Yeah, or indoor pollution and thinking about it. I've seen lots of these smaller sensors around. Um, that sounds cool. Jade, now you had a, a chance to look through some of them that you're interested in? Yeah, yeah. Like, actually, there was one about, like, live coding in Python. They're actually one of the... They were they expressed interest in being uh, one of the projects participating in Sprint. So I was looking at their talk before as well. Oh, great. I think that was cool. And then like like Jolene mentioned, the Python ecosystem is really vast. So like if, if I'm if I'm kind of uh okay in something, I wouldn't know some about something at all. So there were like certain beginner talks that were really good within the PyCascades list as well, uh, that I'm really interested in. Yeah, I what I think is neat this year and i don't know if we touched on it that much we talked about kind of how it's changing to being a a single track conference which gives you a chance to kind of check out the mall you don't have to necessarily do a lot of that (laughs) filling out your own little like schedule as to where you're gonna go Uh, and because it is virtual uh, attendees if you aren't able to check out everything will they be able to check them out later online yes we will be uh, recording all the talks um i think my familiar in-person conference, they uh, stream them live to YouTube and then our AV team will, you know, splice them up into videos um, after the conference. All right. Fantastic. Watch them for free on our our High Cascades YouTube playlist. Oh, great. Do you want to talk a little bit about the sponsors this year? So our sponsors uh, this year, uh, returning sponsor is Microsoft. They've been really great support. I think people have said they really love attending um, their expo booth, like virtually online, and they'll also have a booth in person. Great. Um, I hope you can visit them. Uh, We also have Automatic as a sponsor, Python Software Foundation, uh, API Metrics, returning sponsor, and also, you know, obviously, Real Python. We love you. Appreciate you so much helping. Yeah. We have like a little virtual booth we're kind of excited (laughs) about. And and Dan and myself will be there. So Yeah, we'll see you in person. Maybe get an autograph. Um, (laughs) Sure. I I, I know everyone would be wearing like a face mask, um, but, you know, we'll... We will still continue to have, um, you know, the speaker badges so you can like show, show off like your little wooden badge. Yeah, I'm excited. I, I really enjoyed PyCon last year. Uh, that was my, my first in-person uh, conference, you know, since everything kind of went down. Mm-hmm. And um, it was really neat meeting people and doing some of the hallway track, if you will. And um, I ended up getting a great number of guests by attending the conference. And that's partly why I talked to Dan this year is that, you know, if you're interested in coming on the show, you know, and you're listening to this and coming to the conference, please uh, come talk to me. I'd, I'd love to, to talk to you more about it. Yeah, it's great to have those like organic conversations, stuff you just you know can't plan or schedule for, um, being people in the hall, it's like, oh, where are you going? It's like, as Jolene mentioned, like, you know, we at a conference and we just, you know, <laughs> met up randomly and kept in touch. So <laughs> yeah. it's been great. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Any suggestions, other suggestions you have for people uh, attending the conference? Um, Like, I mean, honestly, Eliza is like a walking example of like how to meet people. She just came up to, but we were at some like, uh, some event that was hosted at the open source summit. And I was just sitting there and she just like with a, with another group of people I had just met and she just came up was like, can I join you guys? We're like, yeah, sure. Why not? And then we, we just like, yeah, kept in touch since then. So that inspired you to do more of it yourself? Well, it inspired me to like, <laughs> I don't know, reach out to more of these kind of e- events and such. And um, yeah, and it was also great because like Vancouver is, is it's like, you know, I don't know, world class city, but it's also quite small um, when you when you join certain communities like Pi Ladies and Women Who Code, which is how I kept on re-meeting Eliza. But yeah, pretty neat here. I'm lucky. I'm the only one with like really my last name, so it's not hard to find me. <laughs> um, but I've been, yeah, networking. I used to be involved like like the Flickr, Vantage Cam photo community. So many people also attended a lot of like startups here in Vancouver and just like attending events. Because when you're a student, like 
you know, you mix with your classmates and like mm-hmm. teachers. But when I started like, you know, attending startup events, you know, bar camp, developer camp, or just like those mini conferences, I couldn't meet people in the field and like build connections, ask them questions. And that helped me like build the confidence. Yeah. The meetups. Yeah. And the meetups and like just building that confidence, like, you know, attending like a conference first time and going up to someone saying, hi, you know, can we chat or, you know, putting up my hand, asking speakers, yeah. dumb questions. And also remember, you know, like to follow up with people, um, LinkedIn or just like similar groups. And, you know, as, as I mentioned before, like with the woman who code and like pie ladies, like I usually only see these people at the events. Like it's not, I won't probably run into them again, <laughs> you know, while grocery shopping <laughs> or at the doctors. So I, yeah. Yeah. That's good advice. I definitely feel the same way. It's hard initially to put yourself out there and want to get, I I know I have a Mm -hmm. podcast, so it seems like I talk to everybody, (laughs) but uh, initially I'm a little nervous to like, you know, walk in and just start talking to people. And, um, you know, everybody I've met at the conferences that I've been to have been open to it. I think one of the advices that people had is if you're in a group talking to, to leave a a section open, like a a slice of pie or, you know, like the Pac-Man and like, so that somebody can hop into that circle and start talking with you. And it's always kind of an important part of keeping the conference going. Right. And it's also like one of the things I like to do, um, it's like introduce people, maybe like they're separate and just like, you know, introduce them like to each other and like help them like form those groups. Yeah. And I could do like walk away. Cause like I said, like, there's some people like I've seen like at events that I've been attending since maybe 2007. This is the only time I get to see them. So I might like chat with them a bit more, but then I also like, try to help pe- new people like build connections, also like connect with them. Yeah. Hey, do you know this person? Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So I think we already mentioned the tickets. Tickets are still available for in-person. Um, I think remote, it's unlimited. And just have to remember, like, on the website, so you can attend either our pre-social in-person at uh, Microsoft the night before on March 17th. Uh, we can also attend, you know, our remote social in uh, Spatial Chat. Uh, we'll be having the same DJ as last year. So it'll be a lot of, like, fun music to listen to. Oh, okay. Nice. And the platform you're using for the virtual conference is the same? Yes, we will uh, be using Venulus again. They've been a great team to work with. We have some new features. I believe Madison has already posted our Venulus user guide to the website. Yeah, I just looked at it. It's a nice tour on there. You can check it out. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, it was actually Jolene's idea because we create a lot of documentation in uh, Notion. And Jolene suggested, yeah, that's like, you know, we already have the user guide. Like, why create two of them just like link the existing information into yeah. our podcast Cascades website for everyone so it's, it's really useful right if you're a new attendee you know or a sponsor or a volunteer you can like see how it works and it's you know it's very whizzy week right what you see what you get for using um Venulus. yeah yeah i always liked your guys's mm-hmm. website thank you i'll pass the compliment on to medicine <laughs> are there things that people should be concerned about as far as what they can bring to the conference uh so we recommend that if they do have a k95 mask that they bring one we will be providing some but we don't have like you know an unlimited supply uh, we'll be also providing uh tote bags for people to carry around their things in we'll be you know serving beverages and maybe like light appetizers but you know it, it's downtown it's vancouver there's a lot of really great food uh, nearby and it's the weekend so um we hope that you, you get to explore you know our awesome sushi and <laughs> fusion food in vancouver uh. I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, just your enthusiasm, yeah, your enthusiasm, uh, bring your curiosity, you know, openness to conversation. And yeah, just your passion for Python. You know, everyone was like a beginner and newbie once. And like, I really like strongly believe in just like continuing to pass along the torch the opportunities that I've received, like down to other people um, so they can continue to thrive and like grow. That's great. So every episode I like to have my guests Tell me what they're excited about in the world of Python. And that can be a package, could be a book, could be an event. Maybe I'll start with uh, Jolene. What's something that you're excited about currently in the world of Python? Yeah, okay. No, I thought about this, knowing that you're going to ask this question, and knowing that I, I'm not working on the latest and greatest. I'm like, you know what? The funniest thing is, uh, I'm actually super excited about going through any version of Python that is later than the one that I'm working on at work. Okay. And so I'm always discovering new stuff that's not new to you guys. So for example, Python 3.10 came out a while way back and they had like things like the match case and then the walrus operator came out in Python 3.8. And I'm like, this stuff is so amazing. And everyone's like looking at me like, <laughs> we've had this forever. I'm like, yeah, but I'm just discovering this now in 2022. So like, let me yeah. be excited by myself. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like, 
yeah, everything in Python is super exciting to me because I'm. It's like everyone's watched a Netflix series, and I'm just discovering it today. Yeah, and then implementing it in some of the scripting that I'm doing. I guess it's not bad that we can spoil it that way. <laughs> yeah, but like now I get to see a preview of everything in your change log because I yeah I I do use a lot of Python at work, just not. I'm not like a professional user like Eliza and and Shaitha are, but more like on scripting and like um like wrappers and stuff like that. And like th- these kind of things are like these little things that that have come out like months, if not years ago. Those things are exciting to me. So, so that's what I've been excited about. Yeah. That's great. Chaitna, you wanna tell me what you're excited about? Yeah. Mine is not exactly answering your question about like new things for me, but it's more like trying to be in this current space that I'm at uh, and and getting better at it because like at work I'm learning a lot about uh, type hinting in Python and then like writing like stricter models and and things like that that the learning is happening on one side I just want to make sure that whatever I'm learning I'm reaching and passing on to the communities that I've always been a part of so it's it's kind of like a balancing thing of like learning and also like making sure that everybody understands how awesome Python is and, and, you know, they're able to channel their Pythonista <laughs> vibe in. Yeah. But yeah. That's great. And uh, Eliza, what are you, what are you excited about right now in Python? I'd say my answer would be a little bit similar to Jason's. I'm also, as I mentioned, the leadership fellow of the Moon Code Python, and we always have a lot of fun Python events. Uh, we're doing Crash Course Python, like for the book club. We're doing a beginner Python series. Oh, okay. We're also using Python in like, you know, examining regex, using, and also, I guess in general, just like using Python to like help build projects, like for people, like build their resumes, uh, upgrade their skills, because with the current climate, right, like, it, it's it's a lot, right? A lot of stress. And I just want to like help yeah. support people when they're interviewing, looking for jobs, or just, you know, doing, um, improving their skills like at their workplace. That's great. Well, I, I really want to thank you all for coming on the show. It's fantastic to talk to you. And I'm excited to uh, hopefully see you all in person here shortly at Pi Cascades. Yeah, great. Looking forward to seeing you there in person. Yeah. Thanks for having us. Thank you so much. And Pi Cascades. <laughs> all right. And don't forget, automatically find and fix vulnerabilities in your Python projects for free with Sneak. Create your free Sneak account at sneak.co slash realpython. I want to thank Christopher Trudeau for coming on the show again. And I'd like to thank my guests from PyCascades this week, Chaitna Gopanath, Eliza Sarabaza, and Jolene Wong. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure that you click that follow button in your podcast player. And if you see a subscribe button somewhere, remember that the Real Python podcast is free. If you like the show, please leave us a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon. <laughs>